Hello and welcome to a special interview. Sri Lanka has been in turmoil for two months, but no one has any idea when the crisis affecting this serendipitous island will actually end. So today we ask, what does the future hold? And more importantly, what are the steps that need to be taken to restore some measure of economic order and political harmony? Those are the key issues I should raise today with the founding executive director of Sri Lanka Center for Policy Alternatives, Dr. Paika Soti Saravanamuttu. Dr. Saravanamuttu, before I come to details, let me ask about the protests which have been continuing for almost two months. Are they gaining in momentum and escalating, or are they in danger of losing intensity and perhaps petering out? Well, they are gaining in momentum and they're increasing intensity. There is the Gotha Go Home Gamma or Gotha Go Home Village uh, in Golfes in the center of the capital, which people come and go, but there is a consistent crowd there that is calling for the president and the prime minister to leave politics. But there are protests all around the country. And today, for example, there is an all island hartal or strike. You know, no one is participating in any work. The trade unions and all of that are behind the general strike. What they say is, is that they will strike today for one day and then they will give three days to the government for their demands to be met. That is for the president to resign and the prime minister too. If not, on the 14th, they are sorry, on the 11th, they are going to start a complete general strike until their demands are met. Now, Goldface Green in the center of Colombo has, of course, become internationally famous as the place where the protests are centered. And I know that the protests have spread pretty widely through the south of the island. And as you mentioned, there is a one day general strike across the whole island today. How are the protests featuring in the north and the east where the Tamil population lives? Well, the protests are not so widespread as far as the north and the east are concerned, but there certainly are protests. The attitude of the people in the north and in the east is that you know, we have gone through all of these shortages and we have gone through the politicians not listening to us and all of that. And so there is less of an enthusiasm for the protests, perhaps, as there is in Golfers. But there are protests in the north and east. Furthermore, given that the shortages and uh, scarcity and all of that is hitting people really hard in the South, they've been used to it in the North and East because of the 30-year civil war. And furthermore, they get remittances from abroad, and those remittances work out in their favor because we have an exchange rate where the dollar exchange rate is deteriorating by the day. And so they get more rupees in their hands. So all in all, they are supportive, they're sympathetic, but perhaps not as enthusiastic as they are in the South. Now, there have been reports, most notably on the BBC, that these protests have begun to unite Sri Lanka's Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims and Christians. In other words, these protests have gone somewhere towards bridging the differences that have divided the island for decades, if not generations. Are those reports accurate or are they somewhat exaggerated and romanticized? No, they are quite accurate. I mean, in Golfes, for example, there is no distinction in terms of caste or creed or religion or anything like that. All the citizens of this country are very, very badly affected by this unprecedented crisis. So they have come together in their desperation, if you like, because they cannot access basic essentials, they cannot access gas, fuel, all of those things. So it is a unity that has been forged out of this tremendous unprecedented economic and crisis of governance that we have in Sri Lanka today. Now on Wednesday, the opposition parties presented two no confidence motions to the speaker. The one against the president, even if it's passed, will not actually remove President Gotabaya Rajapaksha from office because that requires an impeachment. But what about the one against the government? If that's passed, presumably Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa will cease to hold office. But will the motion against the government be passed? Well, that's the key question. There was also an election for the deputy speaker. 
and that election showed that the government had 148 out of 225 votes and that the opposition only had 65. So if that is the state of play in terms of the members of parliament, the motion of no confidence, whether it be against the prime minister or the president, will obviously be defeated. But there is therefore a disjunction between what the parliamentarians are thinking that needs to be done in terms of resolving this crisis and what the protesters and the citizens outside of parliament, what they desire. So in a sense, I think parliament has sort of rendered itself somewhat irrelevant as the new site in which the resolution is going to take place. It has moved out. That is why, as far as protesters are concerned, the Hartal, the general strike today, and then on the 11th, is going to be decisive. Let's pursue the two possibilities that you've just mentioned. One, that the vote of confidence against the prime minister and his government passes. And then after that, that it doesn't pass. If it passes, Mahindra Rajapaksha ceases to be prime minister. Will we then have an all party government? And will we have a clear idea who the new prime minister will be? And will there be problems for that all party government working with Gotabaya Rajapaksa? Because he will continue as president. Yes, there is a certain amount of confusion as to what would happen. The principal opposition parties, that is the Samagi Jana Balavegaya and the JVP, have said that they will not be part of any government that is in, that includes any of the Rajpaksas. Right. So if Mahindra Rajpaksa resigns and the president calls upon another member of his party to form a government, or he calls upon someone sympathetic to him, then another motion of no confidence will be brought and that government will be defeated. What needs to happen, I think, is that the president has to go. And then according to the constitution, the prime minister becomes president and parliament decides on selecting one of its own to serve the term of office, the unexpired term of office of the president. You know, And if there isn't anyone within parliament who they can agree on to take that role, then we can ask a member of the national list in parliament, that is people who are appointed, to resign and bring someone in from outside. The point here is, is that no government with the Rajapaksas has any credibility as far as the people are concerned. And if and when we go to an IMF deal, an agreement, and that has to be implemented, there is going to be more pain and suffering that is going to be visited upon all of us. And we need a government that is going to be able to communicate and explain to us why we have come into this situation, why we need to go through this further hardship. The Rajapaksas just cannot do that. So if Mahindra Rajapaksa resigns as the prime minister, then either the opposition has to come up, step up to the plate and say, we are now willing to take over government, or we are now going to call for a dissolution of parliament where okay. parliament votes by a two-thirds majority to dissolve itself and go to an election. You began, Dr. Savran Muthu, by talking about the need for President go to buy Rajapaksa to go. Now, there are only two ways he can go. Either he accepts the writing on the wall and resigns, or he's impeached. An impeachment will take time, but it may not be easy to do either. Okay. Absolutely. You have to have a two-thirds majority in order to be able to go to an impeachment. And that doesn't seem to be available to the opposition as yet. And as you said, it does take time. So is it possible that someone like Mr. Sajid Premadasa might agree to form a coalition government with all the other parties, but still serve under Gotabaya Rajapaksa as president? Because if you cannot impeach him and he doesn't resign, he's there and you can't remove him. And therefore, if you manage to defeat Mahinda Rajapaksa, you can at least form an all-party coalition government. Would Sajid Pramadeh Prabhadasa agree to do that and be the prime minister? Well, his current position is, is that he will have nothing to do with government as long as the Rajapaksas are in office. And if President Gotabe Rajapaksa is in office, he says he will not serve as prime minister under Gotabe Rajapaksa. What I think would happen in that situation is that whoever is made prime minister, parliament will be galvanized to vote, to request its dissolution and go to a general election. And the general election would be simply limited to parliament or would it also include a new election for president as well? Well, it would be, 
it will be limited to parliament. But I think at that general election, the opposition will have to campaign on a platform calling for the abolition of the executive presidency. And if it wins that election, when it comes to office, that's one of the first things it will have to do. So in other words, President Gota by Rajapaksa could then be removed, so to speak, by default, because a new parliament with a huge mandate for the opposition parties would have come in with a mandate to change the executive presidency and he will be removed constitutionally. Absolutely. Absolutely. What happens in the unlikely event that the vote of confidence against Mahinda Rajapaksha doesn't pass? I know you've already cited the example of the vote against the deputy speaker and how the opposition parties won it overwhelmingly. But in the unlikely event that something untoward happens and the vote of no confidence against Mahinda Rajapaksha fails, presumably Sri Lanka will then end up both with a very serious and growing economic crisis, but also an implacable political roadblock at the same time. Absolutely. If Mahindra Rajpaksa wins a vote of confidence and stays in power, then you pit parliament against the people. And we will expect further unrest in terms of we will have a general strike that continues. You'll have to convince the private sector to come out as well. The country will come to a point of ungovernability. There is prospect, therefore, of violence, also being visited upon us. And then if there is violence, the president could call out the armed forces on the grounds that there is a law and order situation in the country. And the repercussions are quite terrible in terms of we will have a complete gridlock as far as government is concerned. And I presume there could even be questions at that point about the extent to which the armed forces would respond. Yes, this is the key question. I mean, we have been told so far, uh, the armed forces have said that they will always act within the constitution and that uh, they are not going to come out and fire on people and all of that. The point here is, is that, you know, there are probably members of the reg regiment that Gotabe Rajpaksa and the army commander uh, belong to that uh, may still be loyal to the president and the existing political establishment. But... The point needs to be made that the ordinary soldiers, their families, are suffering as well. You know, they have been taken care of to a certain extent, granted, but they are also the victims of the economic uh, consequences of the government's bungling of its management of the economy. Absolutely. We've discussed the political picture and the way it could unfold in some considerable detail. And certainly there are possibilities for a very grim and dire situation developing. Let's turn at this point to the economic situation. I know that Finance Minister Ali Sabri has returned from his talks with the IMF. But before I talk to you about what the Finance Minister would like and whether the IMF will agree, let's, for an Indian audience, Briefly try and understand what has brought Sri Lanka to this terrible economic predicament. I know that in a sense it goes back to the Easter 2019 bombings which severely affected tourism on which Sri Lanka is highly dependent. I know it also has been affected by the dramatic cut in income taxes and VAT by President Gotabaya Rajapaksha in December 2019, which reduced government revenues very substantially. Then on top of all of that, there was the impact of COVID in March 2020. And finally, in May last year, there was that decision to ban all fertilizer imports, forcing Sri Lankan agriculture to become organic. Can you explain what these four factors did to the economy and did they each exacerbate the other? Yes, I mean, the Rajapaksas have not created this situation, but they have exacerbated it and come to epitomize all the faults and defects of the system with their corruption, their greed and all of that. Every single government in Sri Lanka has treated the population as voters rather than citizens and made unsustainable promises in terms of financial incentives and all of that. So we end up with a public service that is 1.5 million for a population of 22 million, which is grossly bloated. And in that sense, we have the characteristics of a Greece. And now we're becoming a Lebanon. So what has happened is, is that we have used our foreign exchange reserves to pay back our foreign creditors. 
As a consequence, we don't have foreign exchange to buy the essential items for day-to-day -day life of our ordinary citizens. Today, our foreign exchange rate, our reserves are below 50 million, and that's clearly unsustainable, right? So we have paid back our foreign debt up to a point, but we still have heaps more to pay. We have $26 billion to pay or something like that by 2025, okay? So we have no foreign exchange reserves. The exchange rate against the dollar has been depreciating on a daily basis against the rupee. When the Rajpaksas came into office, the exchange rate was something like 180 rupees to the dollar. Today, it is 370, and in the unofficial market, you can get it for 400, right? So that is the foreign exchange. Then, then the government refused to go to the IMF, insisted that it must pay its creditors, and started printing money like there was no tomorrow. As a consequence, domestic inflation has spiraled. And people now do not have the three square meals a day that they've been used to. And as I said, there is a shortage of everything that we imported. The situation with regard to drugs is particularly acute. And, you know, there is no let up. The city is littered with queues for petrol, for fuel, for everything. So the Rajpaksa's lack of capacity to understand the economic situation, to have gone to the IMF probably one and a half to two years ago and restructured, started restructuring our debt, that did not happen. They insisted that they would not go to the IMF and now have got to go to the IMF and indeed go to a whole lot of other countries with a begging bowl in hand. Now, the IMF deal is probably going to take quite some time to uh, be concluded. It will take at least six months, according to the finance minister. In the meantime, we need to get bridging finance in order to tide us over the transitional period. India has already given us over $5 billion in various forms of financial assistance. We are asking the Japanese for something like $3 billion. We have appealed to the rest of the world in order to give us money to get drugs. The World Bank has offered us money. Bangladesh has given us uh, some assistance. So we are going around the world with a begging bowl in hand. You know, you mentioned two facts there which I want to pick up on. First, you mentioned that, in fact, Sri Lanka has suspended payments of its $51 billion debt. And secondly, you quoted what the finance minister, Mr. Sabri, said two days ago, that Sri Lanka's usable reserves are just under $50 million. To a layman like me, looking at the country from the outside, that sounds like bankruptcy. Sri Lanka is bankrupt today. Absolutely. There is no other word for it. If we don't sign that IMF deal, we are going to be totally bankrupt. We have no options. We have no alternatives. What exactly is it that the IMF would require from Sri Lanka to agree to a deal? And what is it that Sri Lanka is looking for when it approaches the IMF? Can you give me both sets of details? Okay. I think the IMF is looking for first, a stable government that can implement the agreement and the conditions that are attached to that agreement. Secondly, that agreement has to be made upon a firm, irrevocable commitment on the part of the Sri Lankan government that it will make our debt sustainable and not fall into this unsustainable position that we have. Then I think we are going to have to meet conditions like pruning of the public service budget, which I mentioned is totally overbloated. We have state-owned enterprises, including the National Airline, which are making millions in losses on a daily basis. We have to rationalize that ownership. We might have to sell some of them off. Then we have to probably freeze public sector employment. We will have to raise taxes. Yeah, We will definitely have to raise taxes to restore that terrible imbalance in terms of uh, the money coming into government. So it is 
decisions like that that we're going to have to take, which are going to place a burden on the population. So the last one is, is that the IMF will have to come up with and agree with the government of Sri Lanka on cash transfer payments to the poorest of the population to tide them over the period of adjustment to the new situation. Will that last now, be a problem? Cash transfers well, to the poorest? Well, it will be a problem in this respect. Our welfare subsidies to the poor have been totally tainted with political interference. The poorest of the poor do not get it. Rather, it is political uh, sympathizers and supporters who are beneficiaries of it. So that has to be straightened out. Now, that is where you need a government that is credible enough to communicate to the people as to why they are doing X and Y and Z, and to carry the people along in terms of the sacrifices, the further sacrifices that we have to make. The government is expecting from the IMF, yes, the money to tide itself over, to help to restructure the debt. And once you go to the IMF, I mean, the IMF is like a sort of international sanitary inspector in the sense of you get, you know, you, you get uh, uh, the permission, as it were, to then go into the market and to get finance from other countries and from the multilaterals like the World Bank and all of those other agencies. So the IMF as the lender of the last resort in terms of the international community is absolutely fundamental to us getting out of the mess that we have got ourselves into. You know, as you spelled out the conditionalities that the IMF will impose, two thoughts came to my mind. First, these are very stringent, they can be very difficult politically to accept in a third world country like Sri Lanka or India. Will the opposition parties be able to accept them and implement them? Because they could become very unpopular themselves and end up finding that they face a similar predicament a year or two down the road to the one faced by the Rajapaksas today. So will the opposition parties, assuming they form a government, be willing to bite this very tough, difficult bullet? Well, they have agreed that we have to go to the IMF and they therefore will have to agree to the conditionalities. But I think the reason why the opposition does not want to become government at the present moment is precisely because of the unpopularity that would accrue to them if they started implementing these conditions. That is why I think that they would prefer a caretaker government made up of individuals who have the expertise and experience in uh, overseeing an economy, a caretaker government that will stay in power for one year to sort this problem out, agree with the IMF, start implementing the IMF, so that no political responsibility accrues to the political parties, or rather to the caretaker government, which will be non-partisan. That caretaker government will be non-partisan, and presumably it would comprise technocrats and experts rather than politicians. Yeah, that is the idea. And therefore, I presume you would have a prime minister akin in some ways to Mario Draghi, a banker, an expert rather than a politician. Absolutely. And the agreement would be that he would leave office after a particular period of time. And the constitution also says that we can have elections next year. So he will be there to make the deal with the IMF to start implementing it. And also the other condition that the opposition has talked about is, is that he will also preside over the abolition of the executive presidency. One other question, are the people of Sri Lanka who will actually have to face the cost of the conditionalities the IMF will impose willing and prepared for that? Because this means much more hardship for them. No, that is why communications is absolutely fundamental and key. The people of Sri Lanka have got used to what I would call a culture of entitlement. They have free education, they get a government shop, so they're looked after from cradle to grave. There are no performance indicators as far as public service is concerned. There's no question of them losing their jobs. In fact, I mean, in the past, various people have tried to come up with alternative employment schemes in the private sector with much higher salaries, etc. But people have said no. There is no security of tenure, you know. So 
explaining to our people as to why this is necessary and why they cannot expect to be sort of looked after from cradle to grave, as I said, is going to be absolutely key. And therefore, you have to have a government with a good communication strategy. But in order for that communication strategy to work, people have to have their faith and confidence restored in government. Yes, but there's something else that's required in addition to a good communication strategy. And that is a change in the mindset, if I can use that phrase that's so typical of our part of the world, of the people themselves. The people have to be willing to change a habit of generations. They have to also accept that this crisis means they have to look upon the way they live their lives very differently to the way they lived them in the past. Absolutely. And that is why the communication strategy can do that and engage in a conversation with them and point out to them that, look, we have come to this situation not entirely because the politicians are responsible for their incompetence and greed, but also because we voted in those politicians. We voted in those who promised us 10,000 more jobs and 10,000 more rupees for those people who have the jobs. So there is a lot of hard learning that the entire country has to engage in for us to get out of this situation. We're coming to the end of this interview, Dr. Sarvanamuthu, but let me ask you two more questions. How much has poverty increased in the last year and in particular the last two months? Because that is a factor that will help influence people both to change their attitude, but also it will help influence governments taking tough decisions. How much has poverty increased? Well, there is there are sort of media reports that suggest that the poverty level has now increased to beyond 50% of the population. We don't have confirmation with regard to that, but we certainly know that people are being pushed further and further below the standard of living that they had got used to. And that is why if there is no political resolution, the prospect of people spilling out into the streets is further exacerbated and the prospect of violence is also further exacerbated. So it's an economic issue in terms of the content of the crisis, but it is a political issue in terms of management and that Absolutely. needs to be resolved. Absolutely. Tell me, is it the same dire situation all across the island or are conditions worse in urban centers compared to rural Sri Lanka? Uh, well, urban centers may be worse because producers to come from outside and come to the capitals and go into supermarkets and all of that kind of thing. But outside, it is pretty bad as well. So, I mean, it might be a difference of degree, but it's certainly not a difference of kind. The entire country is affected. My last question, Mr. Ali Sabri, the finance minister said, I think just two days ago, that he believes the crisis will last for at least two years. I noticed he emphasized the word at least two years. You've said it'll take something like six months to achieve a good deal with the IMF. In the meantime, it's bridging finance from presumably friendly countries that you're reliant upon. What will be the situation Sri Lanka faces six months from now? How much worse could it become? Well, I mean, it could be quite, quite bad if the politics has not been sorted out. If the Rajapaksas are still in office in six months' time, then the protesters are going to increase. There are going to be violent clashes. Already the police have used tear gas. Already we have had one person who got killed. It's going to become a lot more violent. And this is what we want to avoid. The protesters so far have been absolutely peaceful. There's been no question of violence. But if this continues, and if in that meantime, the economic situation deteriorates as we fully expect it to be, then we might see violence. And then, as I said, there is the prospect of the military being called out or intervention by the military. My, last question. My last question. Everything depends upon the Rajapaksas, both Gotabaya and Mahinda, reading, reading the writing on the wall, accepting their time is up, if not for reasons of political reality, then because they also know the future of their country depends on them stepping aside. Do you think they'll make that decision and put the country before themselves? Well, one would have thought that they would have done so by now. 
but they are determined to stay in power. I think if they lose power, they feel that they will be terribly vulnerable to all the allegations of war crimes, allegations of crimes against humanity, and of course, the rank corruption that they have been involved in. So as far as they're concerned, the only thing they want to make sure is to stay there and hope that they can see out the protesters. It is a truly desperate situation Sri Lanka faces. I thank you, Dr. Saranamuttu, for explaining it so comprehensively, but also so cogently. I think the audience will feel after they've listened to this interview that they have a fairly good understanding of the crisis, both the political crisis and the economic crisis and the way in which the two interlink. Take care, sir. Good luck. May God be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.